This episode of Tech News Day is sponsored by ExpressVPN and by HelloFresh. Well, let's start our tech news this week by checking in on Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, uh, okay. Well, yeah. as you can see, the Zuck is over in Hawaii enjoying a ride on some sort of electric surfboard. And he appears to have applied perhaps slightly too much sunblock to his face, <laughs> giving him the appearance of a clown or some sort of Japanese ghost. A sad clown. Uh, he's also wearing a soaking wet hoodie because he's incapable of not wearing a hoodie and may in fact be in some sort of hoodie version of like a never nude thing. Because yeah. I've never seen someone wear a hoodie in the ocean. So it's a pretty unflattering look overall. But on the other hand, he's packing a serious peach back there. Yeah, as a lot of people uh, have pointed out. He is dragging a wagon for <laughs> sure, yeah. As soon as these photos hit the internet, they of course immediately spawned memes, mostly of things that uh, Kabuki Theater Mark Zuckerberg looks like here. There's Cesar Ramiro's 1960 Joker on a surfboard. There's Zuckerberg turned into a mime with some very slight edits. A Mrs. Doubtfire with pie face. The ghost from Spirited Away. Commander Data. Queen Elizabeth I. Marlon Brando as Dr. Moreau. This Incredibles villain, uh, Michael Myers. I mean, there's just so many comparisons to make to this absurd photo of one of the world's richest and most powerful men looking absolutely ridiculous. Or at least more ridiculous than he usually does. I don't know. This is like... This is how Mark Zuckerberg should look when he's enjoying his time. Like a weirdo. Yeah. Like, I, I, I assume the photos were taken with an extremely long lens from, yeah. like, another boat. He mm -hmm. looks like he, he was caught doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. Yeah, having a good time, as yeah. humans do. And, you know, look. I'm risking rusting my bolts. I, I also sunburn very easily. I yeah. understand the, uh, you know, better safe than sorry mentality. Yeah. You don't want to be red. You don't want to be flaky. You don't want that skin cancer from the sun. Yeah. Though weirdly, his ears and neck not covered, just the face. So It's because he doesn't let anyone else touch his face. <laughs> Only him. Uh, do I got everything? Yeah, sure, Mark. Just get on the fucking sure, Mark. board. Get on the $12,000 remote-controlled surfboard that you're Weird. on. Uh, Anyways, speaking of looking ridiculous, that's how you could describe most gamer chairs. Mm -hmm. uh, for years now, it's become just a fact of life that regular old desk chairs, they are simply not enough for the average gamer. And the only thing that will suffice is a chair that looks like it belongs in the cockpit of a race car. <laughs> How did we get here? I, I don't know. Yeah. So when it was announced a few months ago that Herman Miller, one of the biggest names in high-end office furniture, was teaming up with Logitech to develop their own line of gaming chairs, we were quite curious what the result would be. Mm -hmm. This is, after all, the company responsible for two of the most ubiquitous and most copied desk chair designs ever the uh, Ames Executive Chair and the Aeron Chair. Also, two of the most expensive chairs available. The Ames Chair currently starts at $1,655 and the Aeron starts at $845, so. But I bet they're comfy. Uh, yes, <laughs> they're expensive for a reason. Mm -hmm. Well, the Herman Miller X Logitech G M Body Gaming Chair has been revealed. And it's, you know, for a gaming chair, it's surprisingly tasteful. Yeah. It, it looks nice. It does. I mean, the price tag, well, it's shockingly and prohibitively expensive. It's fourteen hundred and ninety-five dollars. It's a lot. Uh, but hey, that's the price you pay to have a good gaming chair that doesn't look ridiculous. Yeah, you only have to buy one chair for the rest of your life. So why not buy this one? Come on. Yeah, it's available in just one color scheme, black and blue. It's mostly black from the front, but if you take a look at this back view, it's blue and also very complicated looking. So, so what's so special about this damn chair? Well, aside from being a status symbol like a status symbol like all Herman Miller products and having great American-made build quality, the ergonomic customization possible with this chair is pretty extensive. Yeah, so the arms have height and width adjustment. There's a back fit knob that adjusts the back of the chair to fit the curvature of your spine. And the curvature of the earth, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, there's adjustable seat depth. You can make the front of the seat shorter or longer, depending on... The length of your but is there a subwoofer that shocks you when you get hit in the game, uh, like the old gaming chairs of the '90s? Not in this model, but they say <laughs> they they pull, they they're taking suggestions for future plans. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, there's also the option to allow the chair to tilt and decide how much resistance you want for that tilt. Basically, any position comfort you want for the chair, you can dial that in. Lean. And also, the reason that last picture looks different than the other promo shots is because. It's from the manual for the Herman Miller M-Body chair, which has been available since 2008 and is pretty much the exact same chair as the Herman Miller X Logitech G M-Body gaming chair. Mm -hmm. In fact, the only differences seem to be the type of foam used for the cushioning, which they say keeps your body cool, as mm -hmm. 
as well as uh, more cushioning than before. There's, For your fat ass. Yeah, there's a <laughs> different, look, different looking fabric over the cushioning, and there's yeah. lines embossed into the cushioning. Uh, they even admit to this in the FAQ. They're just like, they're just like, how is this any different from the embodied chair? They're like, well, it really is. For the modern gamer, yeah. was, these chairs were made for skinny, successful businessmen. We worked with the the minds over at Logitech to make only the most basic, minor changes to a chair that we've been selling for twelve years. I mean, for them, it's like you don't really want to go overboard and like yeah. do anything tr that drastically different to like hurt your brand. Yeah. So is this cheaper than the M body? Mm, not really, no. But it keeps you cool. Yeah, it's. Uh... They're like, they're like Logitech. Tell us what. Tell us about gamers. We don't really work with gamers. Yeah, their big fat asses make they're, a lot of gas. They're fat. They're sweaty. Yeah. Uh, that's that's really. They it. don't get up the. They don't get out of the chair very much. So maybe you want to make it a little more comfortable for <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah. So basically, this revolutionary new gamer chair is just a black and blue reskin of an office chair that's been around for twelve years. And also, that previous model has way more color options than this one. Yeah, it's a good looking uh, chair. Dare I say, exactly like a video game, where yeah. it's just 12 years old and they just keep reskinning it and charging you, yeah. charging you for it. This is the Madden of chairs. Yeah. It's a stripped down version of a game that you loved when you were 15 years old. Yeah. Uh, now, even the pixelated support trademark for the cushioning and the sync trademark for the upholstery are, despite sounding like terms specifically made to appeal to gamers, features of the original embodied chair. Yeah, it's fun. I was like, okay, that that part must be new. It's like, no, they've been they, uh, these are terms they've been using this whole time. These babies have only the finest Corinthian leather for the gamers <laughs> out there. Yeah. <laughs> and the OG uh, embody, it's currently $11.75 cheaper than the gamer version. And it's available right now unlike the gamer version which doesn't ship until August 24th. So, in conclusion, yes, this chair probably really great. Yeah. Very comfortable and apparently from what I've read in the reviews of the actual chairs that already exist, will last a lifetime. Yeah. Or at least the length of any job that you're at, for yeah. sure. Um, yeah, it's it's probably good chairs. It's it's also one of the most egregious examples of gamer marketing that we've ever seen. Yeah. So well played all around. Just like just take any product, put some like blue and or red and black. Some lines here or there, maybe some LEDs, and like now it's the gamer version. All I'm saying is, if this thing actually has a lifetime warranty, I don't even care if it's the gamer version. I might get one because if it lasts a fucking lifetime, so I've that, spent more than that over the course of my 20 years of gaming. Yeah, this is the same reasoning behind like not cheaping out on a mattress. Yeah, this you buy like, it for life. Well, Mattresses well, don't last yeah. a lifetime, but but it's like you're spending like a significant amount yeah, of time. You're spending yeah. eight hours every day in your bed. You're probably spending eight hours every day in a desk chair and yeah. like makes sense to want to be comfortable because uh, once you hit 30 the back pain it's just that's what I'm it's saying. just a constant onslaught of the only back time pain. I stand up is when I'm here shooting <laughs> so I mean I, I, I since I switched the standing desk I'm standing a lot more now and it's good but it's like I'm trying to undo like 15 years of, years of damage dude they, when they were when we worked at Machinima and they gave us those uh, they, they, they they were they were expensive for whatever reason, but they had like hard plastic arms mm -hmm. that were like solid. Yeah. You couldn't really do much with them. Just completely uncomfortable chairs all around. You would get like someone who had been working it for five years. You'd come in as a new employee and they'd be like, here you go. Here's your brand new chair. Yeah. Also, the trick, the trick with Herman Miller that mm -hmm. I was told about, uh, which I, I plan to eventually at one point do, mm -hmm. is that, yes, the chairs are stupidly expensive if you buy them direct. Mm -hmm. But thing is, a lot of startups buy a whole fleet of Herman Miller under. chairs, and then they go under. So if you go on like Facebook Marketplace and search Herman Miller, there's all these listings like, yeah, we got 50 of these Herman Miller chairs, and they're selling them for like half off, and they've probably only been in use for like a year, maybe. So, I, I don't want to sit on someone else's farts, though. That's the premium I'm willing to pay. I mean, that's a $1,000 for the fart-free version. Ah, uh, man, you're, you're kind of selling me on the farted version now, actually. Yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> let, air it out a little bit. You push it in. Yeah. And then you hold it down and you spray the disinfectant and then you <laughs> let it go so it soaks it in. Yeah. 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 That's how you do it. Uh, anyways, we spent way too much time talking about fart chairs. Yeah. So uh, here's an update to a story from last week. Uh, on last week's episode, we talked about that huge Twitter hack that resulted in several major verified accounts tweeting out cryptocurrency scam bait, which was followed by every verified account on Twitter losing their posting privileges for several hours while Twitter tried to fix this very serious problem. This week, we have some updates. 
So first off, according to reports from Krebs on Security and the New York Times, the attack started very small, or fairly small at least. Uh, the internal Twitter tool that was used to take over the account was at first being used to steal and sell so-called OG Twitter handles. It's usually like at and then one letter or number. These handles are highly sought after in the hacking community. And the tactic for stealing them usually involves SIM swapping. Don't say it anymore. We're going to get in trouble. But this Twitter admin tool made it possible to actually just go in there and change an account's email address, which allowed ownership of the account to change to whatever the new email address was without the original user even being notified in most cases. Yeah, so. and a lot of these original users, a, a good portion of them are inactive as well. So it doesn't yeah. even really like... One of the accounts they tried to steal is literally a dead guy, which is like not cool. Not cool, man. Yeah. So anyways, before people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk had their accounts taken over, several of these OG accounts were stolen and put up for resale on Discord and the website ogusers.com without drawing much attention. According to the New York Times, who spoke via Discord to two of the people involved in the hack who proved their involvement with screenshots, three of the main people involved in the first stage of last week's hacks are known as Kirk, Lull, and Ever So Anxious. And it sounds like Kirk was the one who took things beyond OG accounts into taking over some of the biggest accounts on the site and soliciting Bitcoins with them. Yeah, so as for how they gained access to Twitter's admin tools to do any of this, that part's still unclear, and there's kind of conflicting explanations for that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the New York Times' sources claims that Kirk first gained access to an internal Twitter employee Slack channel, and that's where he found the admin logging credentials. Uh, there's been other reports in which some hackers are claiming that a Twitter employee was directly involved. Uh, Krebs on security found old leaked forum logs showing that Lowell, one of those hackers was claiming to have a Twitter employee contact on the inside willing to help with the stealing of the accounts. Uh, also, Krebs was able to pretty easily figure out the real name and general location of Lowell. So that guy might be in some pretty serious legal trouble very soon. Mm -hmm. Probably getting a knock on the door. Yeah. Um, but the, the specifics of how this all went down remain unknown. What we do know, according to Twitter itself, is that the hackers did use their internal administrative tools and that all told, 130 accounts were accessed 45 accounts tweeted about the Bitcoin scam bait. Eight accounts had their entire data downloaded, but they were verified accounts. And 36 accounts had their DMs accessed. Of those 36 whose DMs were accessed, Twitter says only one of them was an elected official. So good news, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, it appears to have been Dutch far-right politician Gert Wilders. I bet he's sweating. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, Gert, you really did it this time. Yeah. Well, that guy, he's he like... He's pretty notorious. He, yeah. he has probably had some provocative DM exchanges. But yeah, yeah so no Joe Biden, no mm. Barack Obama, Elon Musk. I don't know. Uh, He's not a politician. Jeff so. Bezos and Elon definitely. Like I, Bezos probably doesn't use Twitter really at all, but Elon probably does. I would imagine that uh, Elon's DMs are not so nefarious and just him just agreeing embarrassing with yeah, agree, like, agreeing with like bad ideas. Yeah. Like Elon, what if we what if we did away with subways and just put single cars down on the ground? <laughs> oh yes, this is brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Anyways, the cybersecurity community seems to agree that uh, for as huge as this breach was, it's a good thing that it was apparently just trolls trying to scam people out of Bitcoin money and not something more nefarious, ambitious, and low profile. Yeah. Basically, it's. It's good that the stakes were this low because mm -hmm. if, you know... The implications like, were huge. If, like, the Saudi government or, like, China or, you know, ISIS, if it, like, that, any of them could have used the same tool to do a lot more damage. So yes. it's good that it turned out with just, you know, a bunch of uh, verified accounts. Well, maybe we doing... should be thanking these low-level hackers <laughs> yeah. because there might have been some work going on behind the scenes to do just that. Yeah. Um, uh, here's some other details. Um, turns out that while the hacker ended up with around $118,000 in Bitcoin, it would have been a lot more if Coinbase hadn't quickly and actively halted transactions headed to that hacker's Bitcoin address. They say they stopped just over 1,000 customers from sending around $280,000 worth of Bitcoin to that address. And uh, only around $3,000 worth of Bitcoin made it to the scammer before that block was in place. Mm. So that's good. Um, also, no surprise, but uh, the FBI is actively investigating the hack as a threat to national security, which, uh, again, very much could have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, apparently, Donald Trump's account has extra protections on it, which, you know, following previous incidents like that time where his account briefly got deleted by a disgruntled Twitter employee. So that, yeah, he made out because of that previous yeah, deletion. Yeah, so that's almost certainly why his account wasn't hacked last yeah. week. 
Anyways, hopefully this video doesn't get immediately taken down for like eight hours for us talking about that whole thing because, yep, that's what happened last week. Yeah. Harmful and dangerous behavior was the charge, but thankfully it was reinstated and the views are looking good. So thank you everyone yeah. for yeah, uh, good job. helping us bounce back from that. We really do appreciate it. All right, next up, uh, we've got Phil coming up with a new rant about FCC Commissioner Ajit Pai. We haven't heard that name in mm. a little while and I'm excited to dive right into yeah. this. But first, it's time for this week's sponsor, starting with ExpressVPN. Have you ever watched The Office? If you have, you probably know it's uh, based on a UK series, also called The Office. But what if I told you there are nine other countries with their own versions of The Office that you've never seen? Well, you probably didn't know about them because they're not usually available in your country. But you can access content available around the world with no geo restrictions when you use ExpressVPN. You see, ExpressVPN lets you control where you want sites to think you're located. You can choose from nearly 100 different countries, giving you access to content that isn't available in your region. If you like watching shows or movies, ExpressVPN is a must-have. For less than $7 a month, ExpressVPN lets you access thousands of new shows and movies on Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney+, and tons of other streaming services. It's a no-brainer, and it couldn't be easier to use. You just fire up the ExpressVPN app on your computer or TV, select a location, and you hit Connect. ExpressVPN is also incredibly fast and doesn't slow down your internet. It can stream content in HD quality with no issues, so get the most out of your streaming services today at expressvpn.com newsday. If you use our link, you'll get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Again, that is expressvpn.com newsday, expressvpn.com newsday to learn more. And this episode is also sponsored by HelloFresh. Hello. Get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. HelloFresh offers so many recipes to choose from each week to help break you out of your recipe rut. There's something for everyone. There's low-calorie, vegetarian, there's family recipes. All every week, there's a lot to choose from. The app works great. Mm -hmm. Pick whatever you want. Cut out the stressful meal planning and prepping so you can enjoy cooking and getting dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes or even 20 minutes with their quick recipe options. Yeah, HelloFresh offers fresh, high-quality ingredients every week for a super flavorful experience. I, I get it every week and have since before the beginning of this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pandemic that we're living in. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really helped with me uh, not going to the grocery store as much as I yeah. probably would. And like I said, the app. Very easy to use, and you can go through that. You get like 20 options. Yeah, the amount of options is crazy. Yeah, so even if like their pre planned things for you aren't something that you want, you can go off menu and pick what you want. Swap them out. And they even offer sides and stuff now. Like you can get bread delivered and extra ingredients delivered. So that's cool. Uh, their app is much unlike other apps out there in the world, actually intuitive and easy oh. to use. So there you go. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 80 Newsday. That's 80 Newsday, and use code 80 Newsday to get $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash 80 Newsday and code 80 Newsday to get $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. All right, Phil. Time to go off, King. When I'm wrong, I'm wrong. For years, I have rallied against head of the FCC, a man named Ajipai. He killed net neutrality, among many other things, but it seems like he's finally done a really good thing with his latest move. Ajipai urges states to cap prison phone rates. In a letter, he said, given the alarming evidence of egregiously high intrastate inmate calling rates and the FCC's lack of jurisdiction here, I am calling on states to exercise their authority and, at long last, address this pressing problem. So this is a big deal because price gouging prisoners or their families for phone calls is nothing new. So let's go back to the article whose headline I didn't actually read all the way before starting. Okay, so what's it say again? Ajipai urges states to cap prison phone rates after he helped kill FCC caps. Ah, now we're talking. With all the weird shit happening in the world right now, I was like, Ajipai, is him doing something good? No, uh, I just need to read one more line of text and he won't do anything good because that's a timeline I don't think will ever exist. So how expensive can these calls actually get? A 15 minute call from jail in Arkansas can run you nearly $25. And this is within the past three years when like cell phones were invented and free long distance plans on landlines exist. The kicker is the language that Agitpi used. At long last, address this pressing problem. 
What's with the fake pearl clutching outrage? Dog, we're here because of you. There are, there are two important beats in this story. The first, in 2015, the Obama administration approved a plan to make prison phone calls more affordable. And Agit, who at the time was only commissioner at the FCC, he voted against regulating the cost of calls, claiming this overstepped the FCC's authority. Second one. In 2017, Agit Pai, now chairman of the FCC, is a big boy, he stopped defending rate caps, which led to the higher prices we're seeing today. How can this guy possibly feign outrage about high prices when twice, twice, he allowed them? Like, one of the reasons I'm always wailing on this dude and TV and phone and internet providers is that when it comes to your choice, you don't always have a choice. Ever wonder why there's only one cable company where you live? laws. Ever wonder why you don't see more local municipalities create their own broadband companies to compete with the big cable companies? Laws. I can sit here and bitch about how many internet or mobile providers suck or when my phone company sucks, but it's likely that I can go to a competitor. If you're in jail, there's no choice. You don't get to call AT&T and ask for a supervisor. There's no shopping around for a good deal. You want to talk to your grandma or get a 15 minute break from the literal prison you're in? That'll cost you, uh, beep bop boop, more than a dollar per minute in liberal ass California. In Missouri, you better get out a, tw a $20 bill for a 15 minute call. Why are these things all fucked up? Well, th this is capitalism. And when you look at the definition, there's two words at the end, free market. And it's hard to have a free market when you have a monopoly. When there's only one cable provider in your town, and there's only one phone provider in prison, that's a monopoly. I realize the reason I have this camera and this shirt and all the other dumb shit I own is capitalism. But when laws are put into place to protect people and policies that exploit others in the name of capitalism, that's corruption. Huh. Realize, I realize the graphic is, is pretty condescending here, huh? Well, I'm fucking kidding because I made the graphic because I knew I was going for a rant today. But just think about this. If you've never had to make a phone call from jail or prison, this topic is something you've probably never had to deal with. And if you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel bad for never having to make a call from behind bars, but realize there are a lot of issues just like this in other parts of society. In June, Governor Ron DeSantis signed a Florida election bill stating that unless they paid fines and fees, felons can't vote. Last week, the Supreme Court held a vote and the majority upheld his decision. Under this scheme, nearly a million otherwise eligible citizens cannot vote unless they pay money, Justice Sotomayor said. It's a voter paywall. So why am I bitching about voting rights on Tech Newsday? Because the same people that abuse their power allowing cable companies to legally raise your bill are the ones allowing huge mergers to happen, and they're the same ones who are greenlighting prison phone call price gouging. It's the same shitty totem pole. So on a national, state, and local level, let's vote these fuckers out in November. They, did, they, did they just lower the graphic again? Motherfuck! Great stuff, Phil. Uh, okay. Uh, anyways, now uh, we got another update to a story from last week. The U.S. military using Twitch as a recruitment tool. It's now been two whole weeks since the last U.S. Army esports stream. And since then, Twitch has apparently told them to stop using fake giveaways to get people to hand over their contact information to Army recruiters. Good. Representative AOC is currently drafting up legislation that would prohibit the Defense Department from using any of their $694.6 billion 2021 budget for gaming-related social media presences on Twitch or elsewhere. As she told Vice, quote, It's incredibly irresponsible for the Army and the Navy to be recruiting impressionable young people and children via live streaming platforms. War is not a game. And the Marine Corps' decision to not engage in this recruiting tool should be a clear signal to other branches of the military to cease this practice entirely. And now, according to Rod Slasher Breslau, the U.S. Army's Twitch activity is on indefinite hold. Uh, Breslau tweeted, quote, New sources tell me due to recent media coverage of fake giveaways and potentially unconstitutional bans, the U.S. Army esports team has paused social activity, streaming on Twitch, and official activations with Twitch, including participating in upcoming Twitch Rivals events. According to one email seen, while there is no official time frame for a return of the U.S. Army across social media or on their Twitch channel, official marketing activations may not see a return until all the way in spring 2021. 
Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Navy's still streaming. Yeah, I still go on every day and ask if I can drive the boat. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, yesterday, the guy that was streaming yesterday was like, man, he was really hyping up how cool the Navy was and how little work he had to do while serving, uh-huh. which is like, it's so manipulative when you actually watch and listen to what they're saying. He's like, yeah, man, I got to see the world. Saw so like dozens of countries. And then I got stationed in Japan. And let me tell you, I got, I got, I worked one day a week, six days off. It was incredible. And I'm just like, See, you're tricking people into thinking yeah. that this is a cakewalk, but also. I'm the, sure, I mean, I'm sure there are positions in the Navy that are like that, but also yes. you might end up in a submarine underneath <laughs> the ocean for like three months with no contact with the outside but, world. But the other uh, like subconscious thing that's going on here that I really think that people should be more aware of is the fact that when you're looking at someone whose entire job it is to play video games for a military branch, and they've served their time, and they're pretty much an active recruiter slash gamer. Yeah. People who see that want that life. Yeah. They don't have to say anything about the Navy or well, recruiting kids all or anything. already, like, every poll of, like, middle schoolers, like, their number one career goal is to be, like, a streamer or a YouTuber. So this stuff. is, like, so the career like... path to be able to sit in a room with a bunch of, R- like, uh, RGB lights yeah. and play video games for the military. But that that's never, like, specifically stated. Yeah. It's just implied by what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And so the same way that when I got recruiters coming to my high school, it's like, I mean, they were government vehicles, but they drove cool cars. They would talk about their homes, what they did on the weekends, like all this stuff. It was like, yeah, they're literally living the American dream. Why can't I have that? And I can if I get this. Yeah. It's very manipulative. Yeah. I mean, all recruitment is manipulative, yeah. especially, you know, especially in this country. Like in other countries, you you join the military and like, you know, it sucks. But like, <laughs> uh, like if, if, you, if you join the military in like Norway, they just send you over to like the border with Russia and you just hang out there for like two years and... That's kind of it. Yeah. Uh, in the U.S. You join the military, and there's any number of global conflicts you might. Yeah, we're always uh, sticking our nose. Have in to something. be complicit. In. <laughs> yeah. Well. Anyways. Yeah. So moving on now. Uh, usually we have a lot of you know so much coronavirus news to cover on the show, yeah. but like, uh, thankfully not so much this week. That's not necessarily a good thing. I mean. No news is okay news, but not great news. Well, okay, in good news. There is some good news this week, In good news, new cases in the U.S. have at least begun to plateau a little bit, but the bad news side of that is it still means around 65,000 new cases per day, Mm -hmm. which is terrible. Yeah. It's just unparalleled at all in the world. Yeah. But at least it's no longer going up. Yeah. We said that three months ago, though. We are like, oh, good, the line's flat. That's the worst it's going to get. And then enjoy your month, America, because school is going back in session, baby. Uh, and uh, yeah, all the colleges are like, we how are we going to have we need tests. We need to be able to test yeah. students. And the government's like, Man, oops, <laughs> I don't know. We don't know how to do gonna... any of that still. Yeah. Uh, it seems like the death rate is going down. I don't know. It, yeah, but it, it maybe it's probably just because a lot more people are getting infected in general. In the beginning, it was like. Yeah, the nursing homes, big outbreak. Everyone's fucking dying. Yeah, well, I think I, think, I think doctors just in general know yeah. better ways of, you know, there hasn't been like a cure or anything, but I think they have a, a better grasp on the illness now. Do you have the Oxford study in here? The one that no. uh, it has it has very good results. Oh yeah. And phase the, oh the so, the vaccine. Yes. The so it vaccine? has very good results. Uh, it's uh, it's looking very good, and it's I, I think what I read was that phase three which is, I guess, before they can start dishing it out, mm-hmm. uh, as soon as September. And they've ordered like 100 million uh, vaccines. Just in time for the next swine flu. Yeah. Well, hey, I'll take <laughs> any good news I can at this point. Uh, yeah. I need to get my stupid dad, I got to sneak this vaccine into him Yeah. before he kills himself. Yeah. I. Oh, God. I, I hope it's that soon. Yeah. I don't have a lot of faith because, because like, the way the U.S., uh, monopolized, gobbled up all the remdesivir. Yeah. I feel like we're going to get retaliation from that by uh, any vaccines that are developed internationally. They're going to be like, oh, well, we're just going to give all this to the EU. Oh, you don't like that? Oh, you don't like one part of the world getting all the medicine? It might happen, folks. Yeah, I I would not be shocked at all. Anyway, also in other bad news, California has officially overtaken New York as the state with the most COVID-19 infections. I mean, we are the most populated state by a pretty wide margin. Texas is number two, and they've got 11 million fewer people than us. So it does make sense that 
at a certain point, there would be more cases here than in other states. But it, it still sucks. It's embarrassing. And uh, it's not for lack of trying either. Like, you look at fucking Huntington Beach. They don't give a shit. Yeah. They're at, LA, they're, everyone that I've seen, for the most part, if you're inside somewhere has a mask on, they might wear it like a dick nose sometimes. Yeah. But uh, people, I guess, here crying, I guess? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I everyone I've seen... The problem um, with this, though, is that, like, my parents in Florida are like, <laughs> look at that. Yeah. California. Liberal California got the most cases now. And look at the, Florida still. And it's just like, no, but you don't understand. Florida Florida's is doing terrible. Yeah, it's <laughs> very bad. Also, your population is way, way, way lower. Yeah, like, I can't remember the per capita And, and also, ones. population density is there. It, there is yeah, nowhere near the same. I, I think per capita, Arizona is the worst. But I, I think Florida might be second worst per capita. I don't know what per capita means, but I do know person, man, <laughs> woman, TV, yeah. camera, or whatever fucking order he says like, it is. Because, like, Arizona's numbers are low, but Arizona also, like, has, like, two cities. Like, almost no one fucking lives in Arizona. Mm-hmm. Well, three. Yeah. Flagstaff is a city, yeah. Elliot. Uh, it's just a lot nicer than the southern cities. Yeah. Phoenix and Scottsdale is one city. I'll mm-hmm. count that. And then, yeah, Flagstaff and then Tucson. Tucson. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Anyways. Yeah. Meanwhile, <laughs> our president, Donald Trump, uh, he, he was asked and he said he has no intention at all of issuing any sort of mask mandate on the national level. He's instead choosing to continue to trust America's governors to make the right call, which is probably not the right call, given how poorly most of America's governors have handled the virus. Yeah. And I'm including Cuomo and Newsom in there. Listen, he says <laughs> he, he, he's finally coming around, though. He says he looks pretty dope in that mask. Yeah, it's but it's too little too late. Mm-hmm. It's... Uh, you, <laughs> Anyways, finally, in international coronavirus news, the British Columbia Center for Disease Control issued some new guidelines for COVID-19 and sex. And among the tips uh, that it offers is use barriers like walls, e.g. glory holes that allow for sexual contact, but prevent close face-to-face contact. Cool. Love love seeing the term glory hole in an official uh, government health guideline. But here's the problem. They're going to get people into doing more glory holes. I don't know. I would assume that the UK is probably the number one spot in the world for glory holes already. Well, this is British Columbia. Oh, British. Oh, sorry. Canada. So this is Canada. Yeah. Anyway, so sorry, UK. Still a, a, a Commonwealth nation. But based on the other uh, research, if you're going to do a glory hole, do it in the safety of an open area, not in a bathroom, because yeah. bathrooms are apparently the uh, highest, one of the highest risk, because uh, if you if you take a shit. And flush a toilet, it just shoots all of it, all of it into the air. Yeah. Also, if you use those hand dryers, it just shoots. It's just air. going everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, that's our show. Um, before we go, I just want to say uh, rest in peace to Michael Brooks, mm-hmm. uh, co-host of the Majority Report, host of Michael Brooks Show, but he, one of the hardest working guys in uh, political online media. Died at age thirty-seven of a blood clot in his throat just completely out of nowhere this week and yeah. Uh, uh, yeah huge loss one of the one of the smartest and funniest guys uh, in political media at all he had a, a bright future ahead of him I, I fully believe he would have ended up like in Congress at some point um, and uh, yeah just very sad mm-hmm. very bad news um, so I, I uh, want to end this show with one of his he, he was known for his impressions, mm-hmm. and uh, one of my favorite ones was uh, Nation of Islam, Obama, which was just a, a parody of uh, basically what Fox News conservatives think of Obama. <laughs> uh, so here you go. Close out with that. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You hear that beautiful music in the background, Sam? I do. You hear that gorgeous call to prayer mm-hmm. of my faith, the Islamic faith, the one and truly only faith of God, the one and truly only faith of Allah? Here's what I'm really doing with the guns. Yeah. White people, I'm about to take all your guns. I'm coming for you. The fruit of Islam is ready. We're locked and loaded and ready to bear, baby. (laughs) No more guns. White people are going to have to pray to the only true and living God, the black God of Allah, and bow ties for everybody. You ready for this? Oh, so everybody's got to wear bow ties. And are you saying that um, basically you're outlying guns, but just for white people? Just for white people. See, that's what people got to twist it. Remember I said I respect gun laws? I'm going to over-respect gun laws when it comes to black people. I see what you're saying. Yeah, there's tiered systems. Arabs and black people get a lot of guns. Iranian people get the most guns because Iran, obviously, favorite country of the world. 
Uh, Hispanic people are sort of in the middle, so they'll get some. Uh, and then there's a tier system within the Hispanic. Mexicans, more guns. Puerto Ricans, more guns. Cubans, less guns. <laughs> Fuck them. Uh, white people, you don't want to make a grand total of how many guns you get? Uh, yeah. Zero. Zero guns. You got nothing. <laughs> For white people. All it's right. just the, the greatest joy of my life to watch those pale, disgusting, pasty faces fall and to complete and utter desolate sadness as I take away not only their guns, but their culture and their hopes and dreams. I hate the white man. He's of the devil. He was made in a cave in the worst parts of Europe, produced from the lowest forms of humanity, and I'm so glad to bring him back to his proper state, enslaved to now, the black man. Now, hold on for one second. Well, on. Stop, stop the music. Let me just Don't ask stop this. that let me, music. Hold, I'm hold, President hold, Baby. Hold on. What? Let me All right.